Sem Zugari. Uh, it's for the third time at the University of Bucharest and uh, second time this uh, this year we are very very proud uh, he accepted our uh, our invitation and uh, i can say um, and correct me if i'm uh, wrong i can say professor Bukhari is now part of our family yes and of course. is part of the uh, big family of the master of the history of ideas and mentality and also it's a former part of the Raiden dojo and I, I thank you very much to Professor Christian Leiden for helping us uh, to organize this conference and also to, uh, to Mircea. Um, so for this conference, uh, Professor Kassem Gari made us a very, very tempting offer. And I couldn't resist to, to this offer. No, no, not the title here. Please make the title. So, uh, the history of the, of the creation. creation. Ah, yes. Uh, yes, the title. Yes. <laughs> you are thinking to other authors. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Skip. We believe. No. <laughs> we stay at the academic and the other offers, the other beautiful uh, offer. Um, there will be for other conferences. Uh, we have already discussed about other topics and for other invitations. So, uh, uh, Professor Dutari proposed uh, for this conference the history of the creation of the Luca, path between work and religious experience. Uh, for me, it was not only a tempting title, an interesting one, uh, but also um, a very delicate and a very important, also, a very important topic because I think. Um, the discussion of this uh, Ryuha system uh, could help us to, to understand, us as Occidentals, it's very important for us to understand uh, the functioning and the, trans or the transmission of knowledge in uh, uh, Japanese world, in uh, martial art uh, universe. And I think you will find very many translations of the word uh, Ryuha, usually the uh, most common translation is school. Uh, but I think uh, with, after the discussion with the Professor Zugari, we'll understand better it's not only a school. Uh, for me, it's a system. It is a, a very uh, complex system uh, that puts together uh, not only knowledge, but experience. And I think this is a very, uh, the concept of Luca, it's a core concept of uh, a strong system of transmitting the knowledge, not only in the martial art, but also in everything in the Japanese civilization, Japan civilization means past. Uh, looking at the title, there were very, very many questions that arise in, into my mind, because uh, I was, was thinking why many researchers associate this concept of Ryuha with the concept of franchise. They say uh, this kind of system and school, uh, it's a franchise. Probably because it's better for an Occidental mind to understand this kind of structure, very specific structure. Also, I think it's very important to, to understand why other academics discuss about Ryuha in terms of aesthetization of violence. They said the system of transmitting the knowledge uh, that put that mixed uh, that mixed knowledge and experience it's also a way of making uh, violence and war artistic and aesthetics. And I think it's important to discuss uh, in the historical flow, the moment when uh, this transmission of uh, knowledge, of let's say uh, military knowledge, is not the proper word, but I don't have in this moment another, uh, became fueled, embedded with mystical, esoteric, spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, concept or. Uh, uh, elements coming from, from a religion. So I think it's very important to, to discuss not only from uh, 
cultural or historical point of view, but also uh, for me discussing the concept of Muka, uh, it's a way to discuss how uh, Japan, Japanese civilization put together life and death, because I think it's also uh, a way of dealing with life and death. How can we put together life and death in a, let's say, balanced togetherness? Can we put in a balanced togetherness, it's a question, I don't know the answer now. Can we put together in a balanced togetherness life and death? And also, how can we teach war in time of peace and uh, how can we teach and could we teach peace in time of war? It is possible to do this kind of thing. How can we put together spirituality and uh, the art of war? These were some, some questions that arise into my mind looking at, at the title and I'm very, very sure after the, the conference, this fine, fine conference, uh, there will be many other questions and many other and many important answers Professor Zugari will uh, give us, deliver us with this conference. And thank you very much thank again much. for being with us together. Okay, so. So, yes. can, you, can you put the... Yes, yes, yes. Let's go. Thank you very much for this uh, very uh, nice uh, introduction, like always. And thank you very much for all of you to come. Really appreciate to be here again. Uh, just in order to, well, like an adaptation or to rebound on what you said. Well, I'm not professor, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just a PhD. Uh, I'm not professor by choice. Huh? Because in the word professor, there is professé in French, which means you have to explain a lot of things. There is also the word for prophecy. Us, no, nah, I'm not a, I mean, a in an academic way, let's say I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit uh, out of the, uh, let's say, the administration thing. So by choice, but uh, in case of research, yes, I'm uh, still doing research, still doing uh, working on many things uh, based on uh, classical martial art and um, uh, the publication of few books in very uh, few months, very close time. So, the theme of uh, this uh, small uh, talk is, of course, the history of the Ryuha between spirit spirituality path and military experience. And it's very interesting because uh, if some of you have practiced classical martial arts, you know, you have many, many, many uh, uh, schools in Japan with uh, Ryuha, this Ryuha, this Ryuha, this Ryuha. And uh, most of the time, uh, the, the meaning, uh, the translation we have of this is a school of uh, whatever the name, etc., etc. And uh, the history, when you study the history deeply, you will see that uh, it's completely different, actually. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of aspects uh, behind uh, the um, foundation of one Ryuha. And uh, this is what we're going to... I'm going to try to explain you those different kind of aspects. Uh, just uh, for things, the picture you see right now is uh, one of the oldest Japanese scroll of Japan. It's come from the Kage Mokuroku, uh, written uh, in uh, 1566 by uh, Kamizumi Sinokami. And actually, right now, when, for example, you do any kind of research in classical martial art, any kind, any kind, in Japanese, uh, in Japan based on Japanese classical martial art. It is the first scroll and the more ancient scroll we have right now. Maybe something exists hidden somewhere in someone's house, hold, uh, forgetting because of the time, but right now this is the, the, the oldest one. There is nothing before, right now. Who knows, maybe uh, someone uh, hide the things or whatever, but it is the oldest one, and uh, one part of the reserve, I mean, one part of the uh, uh, information I'm going to present to you today come from that scroll. Uh, I use it also for my thesis and for many research. Can you move to the second page, please? Thank you very much. Okay, here just uh, before starting to talk, let's talk about the historical source I use. You can see how it's writing. So first, the Kage Mokuroku that I just present, uh, uh, written in uh, 1566. Um, and then the three other books uh, are very interesting. 
because for example when you want to deal about uh, Ryuha founder and uh, knowledge of classical martial arts, they are the ones that come directly. If you don't use them, even for Jujutsu, Kyujutsu, or the art of arch archery, uh, what is known as grappling, Jujutsu and Kempo, uh, well, it is very difficult to uh, talk about martial arts without using those books. It's actually it's impossible. Of course, there is some mistakes inside. There is some mistakes inside, but still, it's a great one. So the first one, Honcho Buge Shoden. So it deals of uh, different, uh, it's small stories of um, all the masters and their disciples of Japan. So you have every Ryuha, like Katori Shintoryu, Nen Ryu. Of course, you have Miyamoto Musashi, you have the Yagyu family, you have the people from the Takeno Cheyu, the first school of Jujutsu in Japan, etc. etc. The second one, the Nihon Chuko Bujutsu Keifu Yaku, it's of course the genealogy, all the legacy with the different master until the uh, uh, beginning of Edo. Of course, you can see that one is of course uh, late 17th century, second one, of course, small mistakes, sorry is of course the middle of 17th century. Finally, the uh, Gekken Sodan, it's uh, all the story of different masters of uh, uh, fighting uh, written in the middle of the 18th century. So this is the kind of thing we use when uh, you need to do any kind of research, any kind of research that deals with Art of Sword, Kenjutsu, Jujutsu, and a spear, and even uh, something called Heiho, the strategy, we will see, I mean, incorrectly translated by strategy, we will see this later. Can you turn the third page? All right, Alors, in the first place, uh, Ryu, uh, I, I said school or not school, in order to play a little bit like uh, be or not to be, that's the question, and uh, let's talk about uh, Ryu. Uh, when, for example, you mention the word school in Japanese, you don't use the word Ryu, you're going to use the word like it's written uh, right now, Gakko, uh, which is the place where you learn. The first kanji, Gakko, Manabu, is a direct reference to uh, the Confucianism uh, Dai Gaku, uh, one of the books of uh, Confucianism, which means the great studies and that we translate nowadays by uh, university. So it's a little bit different as you, if you translate literally. And uh, one of the first time we find a name like Gakko is the Ashikaga Gakko. The Ashikaga was a very famous family who took the shogunate from the uh, 14th century. And uh, they create a school uh, where there is a famous monk who uh, teach to, of course, uh, no problem. Um, who uh, teach, of course, uh, uh, different kind of text, mainly uh, the, of course, the book of uh, Confucius, the different texts of Confucius, and among them, uh, book of strategy. Everything was written in Chinese, and you learn, of course, in classical Chinese. So, as you can see, uh, the kanji on the top for Gakko and the one where there is writing Ryu, all right, it's completely uh, different. The, the kanji of Ryu in Japanese, uh, like uh, it's written, means flow, current. Uh, it's also the way the water goes down, the way uh, things are going on. And so it means that it never ends up, there is no end, it's always flowing. So in that case, you understand that there is this aspect of adaptation, aspect of being liquid, uh, thing that you can absorb, that you can move, so it also reflects, it reflects also uh, the idea of flexibility, adaptation like I just said, uh, and also to match, to fit. So automatically here, it is very difficult to translate this at the time when those Ryuha is going to uh, start to uh, be exposed in a certain way. It's very difficult to use the word school, because in the word school we understand it's a place well known by everyone, where everyone is going to come, you're going to have some teacher, you're going to receive a certain teaching, then you go back home. Here, Ryu doesn't mean, doesn't show any like a kind of a edifice, a place where you're going to learn. It's a way of thinking, a way of being. Uh, for example, if you said, uh, if you talk about a uh, uh, courant pensée in French, like a, a, a tough current, you're going to use this. Hmm? Uh, and when you use the word Ryuha with the aspect of Ha, means faction. 
And uh, when uh, you study different kind of scroll, and especially every uh, text, every entry of the Honshu uh, Buge uh, you can see that any Ryuha, every Ryuha of Japan, uh, are constituted of four, four aspects. Four aspect. And those four aspects are first, the reason behind the practice of fighting method and strategy. Why practice? the military science. Uh, second, um, temple and sanctuary are the birthplace of the transmission. This is where everything happened. Number third is the inspiration or the dream. And from that, the Ryu is going to born. It's always from an inspiration and a dream. And finally, the transmission. So right now, I'm going to try to uh, take you in a journey together like a uh, uh, travel through those four aspects. Oh, the first one. The reason behind the practice. So, you need to understand that uh, the primary Ryuha in Japan, we start to talk about the primary Ryuha in Japan in the 14th century, Muromachi area. And at the time, of course, the uh, warrior have already uh, the power since the beginning, since the Kamako area. So it's the, from the 10th century to the 14th century, I mean, until the 8th, 19th century, the warrior have the power. So in the 14th century, the warrior stronger rule, the power is quite strong. You have different family, uh, different domain, different warlord. And this is the moment where we have the primary name like Katori Shintoryu, Kashima Shintoryu, Nenryu, Kageryu. But what happened before the 14th century? Because uh, Ryu doesn't happen like this. One day, uh, someone wake up and said, oh, I have an idea, we can practice martial art. No, no, no. You need to wait uh, a lot of time, a lot of different kind of experience, and uh, we, we're gonna see this. So uh, when you read all the scroll, the first thing, and this is the phrase in Japanese, yo jaku yori tonso no jutsu o konomite sei myo o hetari. So I translate in, uh, so in, when he was young, in, in, in his uh, youth, uh, most of them, they were uh, weak. Maybe because they were sick, maybe because they didn't eat enough, maybe because they were bullied by other people. But they love uh, the technique of saber and spear. Then after practicing uh, those techniques, they reach a certain subtlety. Alors, in the world of warrior, in the world of warrior class, in the world of uh, Bushi, being weak, it's not something you can express. A warrior, a um, samurai or Bushi, needs to be strong needs to be strong on the battlefield, needs to know how to lead people on the battlefield, needs to be the first one on the battlefield, and he cannot show weakness. So when, for example, you the son of a very important warlord, and you're weak, for example, you don't like practice uh, weaponry, you don't like this, you, you are bullied by other people, this is not really good. You're going to be maybe killed, you're going to be the first one to be uh, uh, May to die on the battlefield. So from that, you're gonna have, of course, your father, your uncle, everyone who have already battlefield experience. They practice martial arts. So just imagine a little bit the context, because you live in such atmosphere, you're gonna have to do everything, everything by any uh, necessary mean to become strong. So for that, you automatically go to what weaponry using the weapon which of course include cavalry, uh, bow and arrow, archery, etc, etc. But here there is something very interesting that most of the book, uh, scroll and uh, chronicle said, uh, this aspect of konomi, which means, you l konomi means, nowadays you translate this by suki in Japanese, means love. So you love, that's strange, right? you love weapon, I mean you attract by the use of the weapon, maybe of course the effectiveness because you want to, uh, staying alive, you want to stay alive, you want to survive, that's logical when you're a warrior, but at the same time you have to uh, develop a certain kind of uh, attraction for the use of the weapon and everything that deals with the use of the weapon. And of course to be able to use it on the battlefield in reality. And from this attraction and the practice that gonna, you're going to reach a certain level, you're going to find something that they call here a seimyo uh, that we're going to 
talk about later, like uh, Myojitsu, a certain kind of subtlety, something that goes beyond what is known at that time among the warrior. So, a certain uh, skills. The second way of, uh, uh, the second reason behind the practice of uh, martial art is, of course, the revenge. Your whole family have been uh, slaughtered, killed in front of you, and uh, you want revenge. You want to kill the people who did this. This happened everywhere. And for that, in order to reach uh, your wish, to realize your wish to revenge and kill the people who killed your family, of course, you have the chance to survive to that. You're going you're gonna to try to find a way. And the only way here again is to become strong, to learn from the best, to go to knock at the door of the people who have the knowledge. And of course, let's hope they're going to teach to you. Because it doesn't mean uh, you come, you knock at the door. Hey, can you teach me martial art? Here it is. I want to revenge my family. Best chance, best scenario, they let you alive. Best scenario. Most of the time they kill you back, they kill you because you, they don't know if you're going to don't use the technique against them after that. So, behind the reason, as you can see, uh, be, uh, behind the practice, the reasons are clear. Weak constitution in a warrior family. Second, seek for revenge. Of course, of course, this is when, for example, this is the most logical. We need also to add another reason is you want to uh, invade different area around you and for that you need to be strong too. So you need to have the best technique, the best strategy, the best people who teach this, the best weapon and of course uh, a certain ambitious. So behind the practice, ambitious, revenge and become strong. Of course it deals also with politics, strategy and everything that goes with it. So this is the main reason behind. Second, can you, yes, just uh, now. Of course, uh, you, you have the reason, but uh, you need to find the people who teach you this. And uh, as I said before, there is no like a hey, here. There is the place we're teaching martial art from morning to night. You have the course night and the morning class. And when you finished after a certain number of months, we give you a rank and you you granted professor. It doesn't work like that. Actually, there is no dojo, like with what we know nowadays, like a academy of martial art, dojo of martial art, sports center. I mean, you need to imagine, imagine 14th century, at the 14th century, 12th century, someone in Kyoto or a city open a dojo beautiful with many tatami and you can wash yourself, you have many blades, you can buy a kimono, etc., etc. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. It's not because you're born as a warrior that automatically you know weaponry. It's a, it doesn't work like that. It's a little bit more complicated, this. We know for a fact that already from the 7th century, the temple and sanctuary are the birthplace for the knowledge. If you want to know, if you want to learn how to write, how to read, you need to go and you need to learn from monk because they are the one who have the knowledge and from most of the time from of course buddhism text they teach you how to write and read and those monks who most of them have been in china and came back with different texts from china they teach also different range different science among them from the 7th century, there is a famous monk known as Kibi no Makibi who bring what we know as the seven, seven book, seven treaties of Heiho. Heiho is everything that deals with what's going to be known as Budo, Bujutsu, Bugei, and later on martial art. Heiho is everything that deals with military science, tactics, warfare, strategy, diplomacy, how to lead uh, an army on the battlefield to understand, to read the combat, to understand weapon. It deals also with the um, army economy, so everything that is with the money, how to uh, have the uh, resource and for um, the army. Horses, uh, the quality of the weapon, armor, etc., etc. And those texts, they are very famous in the world because some of them are like, for example, Sun Tzu, the famous uh, Sonshino Heiho, so known as the Sun Tzu, Art of War, 
translate as art of war, it's a little bit more than that. And you have also the uh, Rikuto San Lyaku, very important text, uh, Shima, Goma, and I'm going to talk about this later on. But unfortunately, before the 14th century, uh, name of Ryuha, we don't have much. We just have few um, phrases here and there that give a little bit of information. And this is what I wrote, for example, from the Honsho Buge Shoden. They explain uh, what are the primary uh, Ryuha. Here in Japanese, uh, in the text, uh, you, I just uh, give it to you from uh, the Hon Honsho Bu quote from the Honsho Buge. It is said that uh, Mutsu no Kami Minamoto Inoshie studied the art, so Tojutsu, and from here he created five levels. Then another man known as uh, Minamoto uh, Tametomo learned those uh, techniques under a master known as Oide Jirodayu Noritaka from the Higo province. And Tamemoto practice deeply those techniques and of course he uh, become a master and uh, another man known as Yonokami Yoshitsune learned also those te techniques of saber from the Kurum Kurama temple and uh, his name become very famous after that. Uh, among the uh, Kashima sanctuary uh, in the uh, Hitachi province some uh, priests uh, study also uh, those techniques and they transmit in the time. Those people are the seven ryu of the Kanto and the uh, uh, seven and um, eight ryu, let's say it's cool, the eight ryu from the uh, capital, Miyako. Miyako is the capital. So as you can see here, when you read this, you have name that they give you name like this, with no date, no datation, uh, difficult to say what is Kur Kur Kurama is a temple, we heard about Kashima, we heard about priest. Uh, it doesn't really say who learn, who teach, where they learn this, where they find this. And uh, of course, a uh, name like Minamoto Yoshie, they are very famous. In the Japanese, uh, for example, uh, when you read the uh, Heike Monogatari, uh, that deals with the Genpei no Tatakai, the family of uh, Taira and Minamoto who fight each other. So we can say that already in the 10th century, where there is those temple and things like that, we can say in the 10th century they, they can use weaponry. That's one thing. And over there they talk about the, uh, the Kurama temple. Apparently they learn from monk from the Kurama temple, which is uh, very uh, known for Yoshitsune, very famous. Uh, warrior who learn from Tengu over there. But do you think you go to the temple, you knock at the door and say, I want to learn martial art, where is this section of martial art in the temple? No, it doesn't work like that. Same, same for the Kashima province. Uh, do you think you knock at the door and say, I want to learn the Kashima no Tachi, that's as known, where is the section, where is the part, who is the monk who deal with this? And especially when you know that temple, they deal about spiritual things, religious things. It doesn't deal about killing people. That's a very important thing to know. So why the temple are associated with the military science? That's the first question. So like I said before, in the temple you have treaties, you have texts. And the people who can read this are the people who are who have education, who are educated in Chinese. So a monk can allow you to read this, can teach you to read this, but to materialize the knowledge based on ex battlefield experience, that's another point of view. Also, there is something we need to know. Sanctuary and temple are the place where most of the warriors who have lost battle and seek for refuge uh, to hide themselves, most of the time they transform or they take the monk uh, the monk uh, habit and go in the temple and the sanctuary where no one's going to seek for them and over there pretend to be a monk and study the spiritual path teaching by the temple or the sanctuary. It can be Buddhism, it can be of course Shinto. And there during their free time in certain place uh, of the temple where there is nowhere because there is big forest over there they practice their own style based on what they read and from the 
experience of war and of course defeat as well because they they fail they defeat and the things they read step by step they start to create to see a new core of using the body using the weapon but it's still at the beginning something very small not something very how can i say uh, very um, skills very details but this is how at the beginning here from the temple and sanctuary this is how things start obviously there is no uh, indication of which monk is doing this who knows this who have access so we can automatically uh, said that there is a kind of circle people knows each other it's a circle where you are introduced where you know who is doing what with who and with that kind of introduction because obviously they need to keep this in a certain secret uh, because otherwise, otherwise everyone on the temple knows here we learn martial art I mean Bujutsu, Bugay, etc. etc. Uh, so at that moment they need to keep this in in certain secrecy and what is very interesting too is uh, the relationship with a uh, different kind of monk who practice deeply in an ascetic way sometimes in the mountain and reach a certain level of knowledge and this example is gonna touch deeply those warrior, masterless warrior, uh, defeated warrior that try to find a, a new way. So by the influence and the image of those monks deeply well versed in their uh, spiritual path and with their new experience of what they have from those, they're going to try to find a middle way to practice the art with the same devotion a monk put in his uh, spiritual path. For that they're going to use, of course, if it's Buddhism um, esoterism, if it's Buddhism Zen, they're going to use this in order to make the warrior path more deeper. This is the first bridge you can find between the two, uh, like military science and uh, spiritual path. This is, of course, for the birth and place. And uh, I just mentioned a few things before. Can you just get yeah, here? For example, on the left side, you have a, a very important figure. is known as Kiichi Hogen. Or Kiichi Hogen, you find that figure in most of the Ryuha uh, of Japan. is uh, at the same time a kind of strange monk. We don't really know who is it. He apparently was in Kashima and then in Kurama. Very difficult to say. And uh, he is the one who has taught uh, that kind of uh, subtle technique that Myojutsu to different students who after uh, start their own Ryu. And uh, the most famous, of course, is uh, Yoshitsune, who apparently, he was a beautiful boy. I mean, uh, you need, uh, what is a beautiful boy at that time? But anyway, uh, he was a beautiful boy who charmed his daughter, the daughter of Kichi Rogen, in order to steal the scroll you have on the side is the Rikuto Sanyaku, one of the seven uh, important texts of a uh, warrior. And from that, he learned different kind of strategy that he practiced deeply with the technique he received from Tengu, that kind of strange goblins that come and give you a kind of inspiration and he learn from them and create what's going to be known as the Yoshitsune Ryu which right now we have no proof that really exists we have the name, we have some technique but back in the days what is a martial art technique like a, a set of technique, a set of knowledge we don't have this until maybe end of the 14th century can you shift from the other side yes, thank you Ron. Now, here you have uh, the idea of how things. So you have the, in the two boxes, one is the Kashima no Tachi. So Kashima no Tachi is every technique. Tachi, in, uh, of course, it refers to the sword, the Japanese sword. But using the word Tachi in the 14th century deals with everything that deals with technique, weaponry. Why? Because a warrior is not known for using sword, but spear bow and arrow and archery. You don't really use the sword on the battlefield because it's a short weapon. You use every long weapon. 
So Kashima no Tachi is everything that deals all the technique, the knowledge, the science, told in secret in a certain circle or in the Kashima and Katori temple. In the uh, other box, Miyako no Hachiryu, so this is the eighth circle that come from the Miyako is the capital, Kyoto, uh, mainly uh, known as uh, Kura, uh, the temple of Kurama. From those two uh, main stronghold uh, in, in one hand temple and sanctuary, you have the Kashima Shinto Yu tradition, so where it's writing Kashima Shinto Yu tradition, you have three great masters uh, that's going to born, and one is known as, of course, Tenshin Shoden Katori Shinto Yu, we call this the Kashima, uh, Kashi, Kashima Katori current, Tenshin Shoden Katori Shinto Yu, Kashima Shinkageryu, and uh, Kashima Shinto Yu. Then from the uh, Miyako area, you have the Nenryu and the Kageryu, those three, uh, four, three current uh, will be studied by a master that I have mentioned the name Kamizumi Sinokami and he's going to create the Shinkageru. Can you shift from the other one? So, uh, now uh, we talk about uh, those, uh, we still, of course, in this aspect of uh, sanctuary and uh, temple here in Japanese, so a uh, quote from the Kagemoko Roku written by Kamizumi Senokami in uh, 1566, you have this phrase, so, so no chuka, joko no ryu ari, chuko ne ryu, shinto ryu, mata kage ryu. so this is what uh, I demonstrate in the first things, uh, so no hoka wa uh, hakaru ni e katezu, so from the old time uh, uh, it existed some circle where the art of fighting, the combat, the science uh, was transmis transmitted and given by the god. Those circles have the name of Nenryu, Shintoryu, and Kageryu. Uh, among them, maybe among them, things existed, but no one could, uh, how can I say, could uh, be at the same level as those main circles. Nenryu, Shintoryu, Kageryu, they were the strongest one. And uh, what is very interesting here, uh, if you can just come back to the first one, yes, yes, so this is the circle. They were the main, main Ryuha, and here again, they didn't have like a dojo. The master who create those Ryuha was the dojo. Wherever, wherever he goes, the dojo is. So there is no like a place. Uh, you can understand that here the meaning of you is really at the same time a circle first, people you know. At the same time, it's something that adapts itself, no matter what the situation, no matter what the area, which means he fit the area. If in the area the science military is to use bow and arrow, his skills in bow and arrow and archery, and he take any kind of weapon of the area and the strategy they use. So a master is the Ryu and the Ryu is the master. And why? Because like a, a flow is still perfectioning itself, is still working itself, is still doing things. It's not completely end up. It's not like you start like this, you end up like this. It's still in evolution. So here we understand one thing. A Ryu, it's not a school. It's a man that studied a woman, back in the days were mainly men, uh, who study a circle he has been introduced because he knows people, mainly in the warrior, uh, warrior uh, society, family, who knows people in certain temples. Most of the time, there were also warriors who protect those temples, or they are attached to the temple because they believe they have a certain faith attached to the temple since generation. So that's the first thing. This is the reason why uh, the birthplace is the birthplace in case of theory, in case of uh, study the main classical treatise, in case of finding the master, but not where the Ryuha is born. This is where they learn, and the Ryuha will born after. Can you shift? And another one. Thank you. Alors, uh, here, uh, again, you have, uh, this is the... This is a scroll written by uh, Kamizumi Senokami in uh, 
1566 and on this he explained uh, how he create his uh, you are just can you shift uh, for the next one yes and uh, this is where the inspiration and the dream so the, the third aspect happened uh, here uh, this is what he what he wrote huh? so the, the first phrase I already translate as uh, uh, その中間状況流の流れあり中古流中古年流中古流また影流のありその他に測るに活動そのようは小流の大げん大きめて影流において別にせいみをせして新影流と合うあると translation uh, like I just uh, translated before, in the olden time, there is, uh, it exists certain circle where the science of fighting, of combat science, was transmitted by the Kami. Those circles have names like Nen Ryu, Shintonu, and Kagari. No other style could uh, face them. And now he said, I practice deeply the highest and the highest technique of those uh, Ryuha, but I find in the Kageryu something more subtle. I practice those, this subtlety very deeply and I create the Shin Kageryu. And he mentioned on the Japanese side, jite, so I receive a kind of inspiration. So what kind of inspiration? Most of the time, what we know is after they learn, from different masters, they move away in a certain area, in mountain or in a place of a temple that no one goes there. And during a certain number of days, seven days most of the time, sometimes thousands of days, according to certain chronicle, they practice deeply, every day, morning to night. And even the time for eating, the time for praying is very uh, limited to uh, a, ve uh, a certain amount of minutes of time and even during that time the positioning the physical attitude is turned to be ready of using a weapon or turn to be ready to face any kind of opponent so during those seven days every morning cold shower praying teaching until late at night and they reach a certain kind of uh, physical and psychological limit where the brain the way of thinking the way of reflect is uh, because of uh, the tiredness you reach a very extreme tension and at that moment something happened it doesn't say if they smoke weed if they took drugs or if they drink sake a lot and then after that they see a shad and they think uh, it's a woman or a tango because what you need to understand is this is the moment where you're very you're extreme tired after an exhaustive practice praying cold shower with the strictly minimum comfort most of the time there is no comfort and they stay in meditation and they have techniques striking in the tree in the late at night so imagine you know after a few days like this Every song, every word, bird, anything looks strange. A word can be, or a song can be uh, uh, interpreted in many ways. It happens even nowadays if you take someone out of his zone of comfort and you put him such, uh, through a, such an extreme um, practice, something is going to happen, uh, like a psychological shock. So, what happened at that moment? They said, uh, some chronicle said, a man, not really man, strange face, long hair, Yamabushi, looks like a Tengu, start to teach them a technique, a certain set of techniques. Sometimes they even said, the Kami, so Kami, whatever, materializes in the front of them and give them something. And here, Kami Zumi, so no Kami doesn't say this, he said, I receive an inspiration. So yes, you practice, something happens in you and you do a movement, you do a movement, you do something that your body is not used to. And even the brain, your, the way you think the movement, the way you use the weapon, uh, is strange for you. For example, everything you used to do with a certain strength, with a certain uh, psychological tension or body tension, you don't feel it anymore. And it happened during a fight. 
at that moment you do a movement in order to survive, to do something and you kill someone who came to attack you or you just cut a branch or you felt something behind you and you do a movement that you don't really recognize the, uh, let's say, physical muscle activity that you, you have provided for seven days, eight days, thousand of days. And at that moment, it's like it's the enlightenment. You, wow, that's what happened in your body. You feel, hey, this is great. Or, wow, I find something. Well, I try, of course, to make it easy. Huh? They are just men and women. So they might feel something like uh, uh, what just happened to them. This is it. This is what they need to find it. The problem is, when, you f when they find it, it is very difficult to uh, keep it. So from now, the job is to do, to go to meet other warriors, to go on the battlefield in order to recreate, to recollect all those souvenirs and find this way of moving. At that moment, let's say that the primary idea of the Ryuha, and this is how, for example, the name like Tenshin Shoden Katori Shintoyo means Tenshin Shoden is a direct transmission from the God because what he received, the man believed that this comes from a Kami. If it's Kashima Shinkage, Shinkage means uh, Kami no Okage, which means by the help of the Kami of Kashima, I receive this. Hmm? Uh, now, when we say the Nen Ryu, it's because the, the monk learned from a Nen, Nen, the intention, so is everything is in the intention. If it's Kage, Kage means the shad, the shadow to hide, so is the circle of the Kage. So, most of the time, at the very early beginning, the name of the Ryuha materialized at the same time the level, the inspiration, and what we're looking for. So, the, the duty now, the Yes, the duty, the work of the master, which is not really yet a master, huh, is, is working to master the skills, is to find a way in order to recollect, rebuild what he sensed, what he felt, and to step by step put a name on that, put a structure on that. And what you need to understand, and this is very important, they are warriors, which means they already have Battlefield experience, which means killing people. Huh? They had many heads and many dead people in their closet. Uh, they did very crazy things, huh? alone or in group, on the battlefield or outside. So we're dealing with uh, blood and extreme situation. So going in a temple, going in a forest in order to uh, find a way, it's a way to find the balance. And it's always between two critical situations, this balance that they find something and the job is of course to uh, be able to find uh, the way to a way back to that sensation. And it's not like they practice a basic technique. Here, uh, Kami Zumi no Kami, when he talked about the different Ryuha he study, he said, Shoryu no Ogen. Our Ogen in Japanese is a very interesting uh, uh, kanji. I'm going to write it like this, you can uh, see it. Alors, Ogen. He used the two kanji. Il est 18 heures. So, Ogen and uh, Ogen or Kiwame. This Oku in Japanese. Oku, uh, for example, if you go to Japan and you want to talk about the wife, uh, you said Oku-sama. It's very famous. And uh, I'm sorry, to, I'm going to tell something. Maybe most of the women, please don't judge me. It's not me. It's Japanese and Chinese or so any complaint. Uh, oku in Japanese means what is deep. So, for example, when you said the deep transmission, it's uh, okuden. So, but what we call the wife okusama in Japanese because she's 
a place in the room is the last, last place, the deep place of the house. I don't know if it's the kitchen or not, but uh, that's why they said Okusama. So the one who is deep, or maybe the one who knows the depth of things, you know, you can take it in another way, the, the one who knows the, the deep knowledge. And Yen in Japanese, Yen means the, the origin, uh, like the Minamoto. So when you say Ogen in Japanese for Yuhan, Ogen no Jutsu, is the technique, the deepest technique is at the origin of the Yuhan. So there is no like such a thing like basic technique, how to hold a weapon, how to do things like this. Is The first technique used and find to create the Yuhan is the basic technique, is the highest technique. So you, you go directly on the highest technique. And that's a very important aspect. Why? Because you can understand that when you go to a school, when you want to learn from someone, it's going to say, for example, you need to learn how to stand, how to hold, how to sit, how to hold the weapon. So you're going to spend a lot of time on what is known as the basic things. But obviously here, there is no class on the basic things. You need to know the basic things, which means to kill people, unfortunately. And that's what it deals about. And automatically, the Ryuha start from the highest level. So when Kamisu Misi no Kami said, I learned the best and the highest technique from those different kind of circles. And from that, I will practice. Practice means kill people, then you stay alone, then you practice, then you try again, and you find. And from that, something happened. You find a subtlety. And that subtlety is the beginning of the Ryuha. So very important to keep this in mind. And when you said Okuden, for example, uh, in a Ryuha, you have the free uh, aspect, the free uh, teaching, the free transmission, Shoden, Shuden, Okuden. Okuden, is, is, most of the time, is uh, um, the highest level or the deepest level uh, of a Ryuha. So I keep on going. Uh, Thank you. So he learned this, and this is the moment where he creates, uh, he has this idea, and he's going to do his journey. And during his journey, of course, as you can see, he doesn't create a place where he's going to sit and try to develop the technique with the people who's going to come. No, he's going to go on the battlefield, he's going to try to make himself known. Most of the time, they go to the uh, court in order to show themselves. So once they are known very well on the battlefield, they are, and they are not known for the sword, they are known for the spear, they are known for uh, the way they lead the people on the battlefield, they are uh, uh, known for their courage and to face uh, many opponents with uh, only uh, a small weapon sometimes. So once they start to get known, they teach here and there, and there is many uh, warriors who knock at the door because they are known. And those warriors, what they want is, of course, to have a, to become famous. And the best way to become famous is to kill someone who is famous. It's like this everywhere. So they arrive in the front of uh, the master who accumulated more and more experience. And what is very interesting in this 14th, 15th century, when the warrior, young warrior, come in the front of the master, which most of the time is a little bit older, he asks for a fight, and the master can say yes. He could kill him, but he doesn't. He just disarm him, put him down away. And we have a lot of uh, episodes of this, which is very interesting. In a moment where killing, take the life of someone, costs nothing, this master, after many years and experience, doesn't kill. He just knocked down, take the weapon, said, ah, oh, what you did is not good, your position is not good. Too bad for you. Uh, oh, I don't need a weapon to put you down, etc., etc. And at that moment, the young warrior, who of course, have been on battlefield, doesn't understand. He said, "Come on, I'm... no way, no, no way." I mean, I don't think he said this like this. He just bow and said, "Please take me as a disciple." And at that moment, of course, when he asked, yes, he needs to bring a certain kind of present, and he followed the master where he goes. He follow the master where he goes. And from all the accounts, from all the chronicles, we never heard like the master start to explain how to practice, how to hold this world. Most of the time, the first thing is to observe. The student observe, the disciple 
observe. And by observe, he learn. Did the master explain? We are not really sure because the technical, the, tec uh, the, tec the technical lexic, the word doesn't really exist at that time. It's mainly a body experience. It's very difficult to put words. And when they start to put words, the only way for them to put words is to use, for example, what they've been uh, educated before. So if, for example, it's Buddhism Zen, they use Buddhism Zen, lexical. If they have been touched by certain words in Buddhism Zen, they're going to use this, or Buddhism Esoteric, or Shinto. This is the reason why, in most of the name of technique, you find Buddhism influence, esoteric or Buddhism, or Zen, Shinto influence, phenomenon, like uh, 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 the uh, meteorological phenomenon, uh, nature observation, or animal uh, description. And this is the main words you find. You won't find, like, for example, things you have in Judo nowadays, or Karate, or Aikido, which, for example, when you have Sewinage, which means a hip throw, which is very easy for us to understand. They will never use words like that. All the world will always have a kind of um, first, a first influence that comes from a different, can back, different background, spiritual or not. Hmm? or uh, natural uh, phenomenon observation or uh, animal insect movement and sometimes, sometimes if the master have a certain uh, education in way of writing and reading he might even create the name himself or take a Buddhist things that he like and he understand in his own way and put his own reading and this is very interesting so automatically here you, you, you can see that certain masters have that kind of level because they were well educated. Not all of them, it's not all of them who wrote scroll. We have a lot of uh, examples where there is no uh, scroll, for example, and you need to wait the second, the third, sometimes the fourth generation in order to have something known as a system well structured. Because at the beginning, you don't really have this. We just need to wait actually. The Kamizumi Seno Kami is the first one in Japan who put everything with a certain order, uh, with a certain mindset, uh, with a certain direction and orientation. Because don't forget that a you, a flow, need an orientation, need a direction. With no orientation, no direction, there is no meaning. And that's very important to give a meaning, a quest of meaning. So that's how it starts. And then the master make himself known and he try while in practicing, apply, remove, take, add, change, he creates one day his Ryuha and said, my Ryuha, this is the name of the Ryuha, and he will find a student, a true disciple, and this is the last one for, yes, tac, tac, the transmission. At the moment, start the transmission. And in the transmission, there is two aspects very important. There is a direct transmission, which means man to man, woman to woman, human to human. So this is everything that deals with the way you observe, the way you sense, the way you feel, the way you measure and ponderate the man or the woman you have in the front of you, the way he talks to you, the way he talks to people, the way he sit, the way he walk, the way he interact. This is the whole transmission. It's not just about using a weapon, kicking, striking, it's, it's a life, it's a you. So it's, a, it's every aspect. And then you have the written transmission. And the written transmission, it's everything that deals with the document. If the master have the capacity to pass down his knowledge through writing. And here, of course, again, because everything happened in temple, everything happened in sanctuary, what happened? They're going to use the model used by Buddhism and other monks in order to transmit their knowledge. So they're going to use different kind of level. Most of the time, what we use was the Inca, which is the authentication or the certification of transmission. And they give with this few scroll like there is here and on those scroll what is written is very the the essential if you didn't practice with him if you didn't saw him you won't understand you need to have the practical part you need to have the practical part 
without the practical part is impossible to understand. I mean, you can read, I know a lot of Japanese who can read, but doesn't have, the, doesn't have a clue of what it means. Why? Because it's based on body experience. So in other words, and I'm going to finish on this, the practice is at the heart, is the heart of the Ryu. And if the practice is not practical, and you understand that in the world, practical you have practice, and in practice you have practical, well, there is no meaning to call this a Ryu. There is no adaptation, it's not fit, because what fit, what adapt, what is flexible is practical. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you appreciate and please ask your question. Thank you, thank you very much. I think now it's more and more clear, and uh, I think you have, oh, sorry, thank you very much. We have more answered our uh, question about this uh, not school, not system, but way of <laughs> not school, not system, but uh, way of uh, learning and not not way of learning, but way of receiving yes, some yes, yes, knowledge. Yes. If we well understand, please questions. Uh, j just before, because you said something very important. Yes. Uh, here, I try to manage in 45 minutes uh, to explain at least something very complicated. Normally, we need, I give you the main idea for every you have. But it's true, sometimes, uh, according to the master, it can be a system. Sometimes it can be something very stiff, because there is different kind of flow. Stiff flow, hard flow, stupid flow, clever flow. Yes, of course, you need to understand that the flow reflects the master. That's very important. What he receives and the way he's going to learn and find the right man who's going to receive it, it's always like a, it's a human relationship. You need to have three kind of relationship. This is the son then. The first relationship is with the master. The second relationship is with the practice. And then finally is how you're going to match those two inside yourself. And those three are very important. That's why sometimes, you know, it depends on what you seek, what you're looking for. And this is the reason why on those kind of transmission, there is always only one student. They use this aspect of Ishi Soden that I didn't talk too much about it. The transmission from one to one. And that's a very important aspect too. So it's true, it's quite deep. Yes, yes. question please. Questions, questions please. Um, yes, Miko. Uh, this one? Yes, yes. yes. One Back at me. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, the children of the war boys. Did they have any, uh, I mean, not the children, but uh, the world wars, did they have any structure curriculum on which they taught their children the basics of war? Or it was more like, we know that this happens, you should strike like that and that, and there is nothing structure, it's more like... Well, I think it's more random, you know, uh, it's, it's always dependent on the individual. There is uh, a lot of things come from experience. At the same time, it is important to know that among warriors, teaching things depend on many. It depend on the relationship. Uh, if it's a love relationship, two men who love each other, that happen a lot. So there is this. Uh, if it's a father to son, if it's a master to disciple, or if it's a vassal to the law. So there is always that kind of a very uh, strict uh, but open relationship between two uh, human beings and according to that maybe he's going to teach a little bit more or not maybe he's going to just say look how i do look this don't forget remember read this it depends on the master it can be very detailed like it can be not detailed when you look on the score for example kamizumi sunokami to my point of view what he wrote is the essential sometimes the essential can be completely without detail, and sometimes it can be full of detail. It depends on the way you practice here again. If you have enough um, experience, uh, the small detail, from one detail you can rebuild the full essence. But for that, of course, it's about the experience. So in the case of war, it can teach him. So look how we lead the people on the battlefield. I don't think you can learn leadership. I think you have to see someone as a leader. And then because you stay close to him, there is things that are coming and then you copy. 
That's one thing. For the technique, uh, it is possible. I said here, you need to cut like that because this in this way, he died in this way here. The armor or weakness is like this. And if, for example, you don't find, good luck to you. Something like that. Mm. I mean, our, I mean, our most recent experience is like, for example, uh, ch soldier children in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. When they start from very small, they give them uh, AKM, and they start shooting, and they give some experience in the battlefield. I mean, they don't have like a very structure. I mean, they have a structured learning. But I was thinking, if uh, people in those days, if you took someone who was small, how would the uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, the idea that they teach them when they were very young, I think it's only on movies. Why? Because the, uh, I don't think the, the, the child psychology changed from nowadays to the 4th century, 6th century. A child is a child, all right? Uh, kids, I mean, boys love to fight and they're gonna do, they're gonna play like and try to do like the adult. And uh, now to just have the mind of a child uh, concentrate for 30 minutes in order to practice uh, a technique and using the right amount of power is really hard to teach this to a kid. So 90% of the case there is, um, there is a kind of process. This process, for example, it's known as Ujin in, uh, in, in Japan. And uh, first, when you reach more or less 12 or 13, they send you to the mountain. You stay in the mountain alone without the parents, so some warrior, some Yamabushi, they take you over there, so you know, you scare with a group. Then after a couple, certain amount of time, you come back and uh, you go to see women and you go to drink and then after that you go to the battlefield. When you can survive to the battlefield, you did your Ujin and after that, so it's not everyone who could do this. Uh, it's not everyone. I mean, few of them could survive. The people also were hiding behind Papa or behind the grandfather because they really loved their son and said, just look, stay here, be protected and learn. And there is some who really go in, protected too, so they fight, but they, you know, they have some kind of guard around. You can imagine every scenario because it already exists everywhere. And then the way they practice come with the age. If, for example, they live in a very dangerous area, for example, the castle or the manor is in the center of different kind of battle. They're going to learn the hard way, and the hard way is to survive. Kids who live, for example, in a very poor way, like in Brazil, like in Africa, they learn to survive very fast. They, they lost a little bit of innocence of child. But then, when they have to play, they play, and if the danger happens, they know how to move very fast. So this is something also, for example, uh, a son who is born in a warrior ship is going to be treated in a certain way. Move, but doesn't mean that a uh, father who is a warrior doesn't and love his son and it, it is difficult to say if they learn for example from six to this maybe they teach them a little bit maybe they show them a little bit but I don't think uh, it exceeds uh, five or six minutes and you're very happy that he didn't wow great my son you did great I go move uh, I, I, we need to be very careful about that huh? and I don't think they used to teach child most of the time they said when they were young they love now, how deep they love, how deep they could survive, only the people who could do it uh, could write about it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Hello, sir. Nice to see you again. As I know, uh, all of you who uh, have a connection with uh, Chicago, you use the Marichite. So, uh, why do you think uh, Kamizumi is a choose Marishita? Actually, I think Ito Ito uh, before him, Aizui uh, Kosai used the, uh, the Marishita for, uh, how to say, uh, for improve his uh, training. Why they choose Marishita? Why they don't choose another uh, gods? Oh, first of all, uh, the first time we had the mention of uh, Marishita, uh, is mainly from uh, Seiki Chusai. So apparently he heard it from Kamizumi Sinokami. Kamizumi never used the word Marishiten, he used the word Tenzuru. It's the same kanji, uh, but read it another way. That's the first thing. Uh, did he receive this from 
I su eco psi or not? Here is the question. We know for a fact that first I su eco psi didn't wrote. Uh, I su eco psi is the master of Kamizumi Sonokami, the one who wrote. Mari Shiten is uh, an aspect, a technical aspect that you have in every Ryuha. Uh, actually, the kanji, here it is. It's very interesting because, um, you know, what used to be known as a secret now is used uh, in a very different way, you will see. Uh, look how you can play with martial arts. So, this is the kanji for Marishite, and on this you have the aspect of shift, rotation, remove, um, circular, uh, pivot, uh, it's a lot, a lot of things. You know where we use this now? We use this in this country. And this is going to be very funny. Jitensha. Jitensha is the bicycle in German. So, uh, why? Because the, the ring, the row, is turning on itself. So, very interesting how something like that here and here, used in Buddhism actually, very important the way, for example, things shift from one side to the other, move from one side in a very subtle way. And that's the things that uh, Kamizumi Senokami found through the technique known as Enkai and MP. But come back to the topic. So, Aisu Ikosai wrote nothing, and we need to wait uh, his uh, second son and uh, first son, uh, Shichiro, who wrote a scroll uh, that we find uh, known as the uh, Kanesada uh, Kage Ryu. On this scroll, it's very interesting because he explained what his father gave it to him. Uh, and he knew, of course, Kamizumi no Kami because uh, they learned from the same uh, at the same period. And what he described is uh, Marishiten, uh, that we call Tenzulu, uh, etc., or Enkai, etc., etc. The thing is, uh, this aspect was already demonstrated by uh, Isasa Choisai, uh, the founder of the free primary Ryuha in Katori Kashima. So there is one is. Uh, is Asa Choisai, another one is Matsumoto Bizen no Kami, sorry for the Japanese name, and the uh, third one is um, Tsukara Mokuden. And Kamizumi Senokami learned from the, uh, the two previous ones, the first one uh, was not yet born, and he learned something from them. So everyone has something great, everyone reached a great level, and uh, for a master, great master to find a great disciple is very important. At the same time, the disciple needs to fit the time. So they all have this aspect of Marobashi Ten because you find it in many kinds of techniques. Some Kamae, for example, known as Kuruma Kamae or Sha Kamae, is this aspect also of um, Marishi Ten. Everything that deals with cutting up down is also the aspect of it. Now, the way of using the body, few of them really had, and if they had, how deep they have it. I think Aisu Ikosai have it for real. And this is what touched Kamizu Misenokami, that's why I learned it from that, and this is the highest technique they have everywhere. So they are all linked to Shinkage and Kageryu, but Nenryu have it. Everyone have an aspect of this, because very important, if you get the kanji, huh? if you do a study of the kanji, huh? etymology study, this part is the part that moves like this to like that. And this part is the aspect that moves like this. So maybe some master have just this, some master have just that, some master finds something and he focuses only on what he finds and the one who have the more open mind and study the most, and can, of course, make the bridge between each, the connection between each, here it is, you find it. We don't have a, uh, like, a, yes, it is like that, uh, an explanation completely straight. The best is to understand that Kamizumi Sunokami was the genius of his area. 
and he could explain it and give it to uh, Yagyu. And also have uh, good information because he studied three lines, different lines. Yes. Kashima, uh, Kashima, yes. So, well, yes, he, he studied Nenryu, huh? and Nenryu, of course, is direct from, uh, from uh, Kurama as well as Kage. And uh, we know also as a fact that uh, the founder Aisui Kosai was one of the 12 students, 12 disciples, sorry, of Nyon uh, Jelami, uh, the founder of the Nenryu. So, automatically, he had the things. And another thing, like I said just before, it's circle, so people. Strong people know each other. Strong warriors, people who have knowledge, they know each other. So people from Kashima know the people from Nen. Nen know the people from Kashima. And the knowledge, it's the same everywhere. What's going to change is the way to apply and to be practical. Some's going to be practical in a certain way. Other more complete, more incomplete. Time will say, it's the same, it's always a Ryu Nagari. Who's going to be more flow, fluid? Who's going to be more influent? Who's going to be more open to the flow? And with time, everyone learns the most. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. Please. Other questions? Comments? Yes. Yes. I have a few questions. So, first of all, uh, if I answer correctly, uh, the former warriors used to retreat to the temples, right? Yes. Okay, so they were seeking for something uh, more uh, deeper in a spiritual way, right? Uh, no, I think because the, there is two ways to escape <laughs> back in the days. Mountain, where there is no one, or temple. But when you go to the temple, you have to shave completely yourself transform and of course in order to not be fined by the other to dress as a monk and accept uh, to follow uh, the rule of the temple that was the only way i don't think they go there for spiritual path you know after when you lose the war uh, you want it uh, the only thing you're looking for is revenge how to recreate your clan and wait and build another strong family study everyone so that's the idea of a warrior when he when he lose the fight some of them maybe uh, find uh, the light and said uh, i don't want to fight again i want to go to the temple maybe but uh, at the very early beginning this is pretty much rare maybe of course when they get into the temple after a certain time quiet they are touched by uh, the atmosphere by what they hear and understand that the, the path of the weaponry, military, uh, looking for fame, uh, to have your own domain, to be uh, the best, is uh, vain. That's possible too. But if it was this, it doesn't create a Ryuha. It doesn't need to practice martial arts. It doesn't need to find a certain technique. If they really get into spiritual uh, path, they quit. And why? We see this uh, many times, for example in the Yagyu, even Kamizumi Senokami, even the people from the Kat uh, Katori Kashima, when they reach a certain level, they, they quit. Once they give the transmission to someone, they quit the warrior path and become monk, change name most of the time, and uh, devoted their life in uh, poetry, reading things, no practice of martial arts. So there are monks who are really monks, and there are warriors fake monks yes fake monks because i was uh, interested in why would they uh, train themselves to become better and after that they would go to the battlefield and kill more even more if they want to be free but here, it, here it is uh, like uh, let's take for example uh, a general or someone from a very important family and he's going on the battlefield and uh, he lost his whole army and the first thing we're looking for is the head of the general. So he's held by his retainers who died for him in order to escape. And the main idea is to come back with a bigger family, bigger clan, and rich of the experience of the past. So that's the reason why you create something like this. You go over there, you hide yourself, you wait, people forget you. The reason why, for example, when they kill, uh, when they destroy a family, they have to 
destroy everyone in the family from the kids and everything because they're scared the guy come back the revenge so that's a very important motif uh, and when they are in the temple I'm not saying you know they are not touched by what happened but it, it happened also by, by what they feel by what they experience uh, in the relationship or in the contact with the monk uh, and the uh, philosophy and the way they look like uh, but there is also this aspect of revenge I want to come back when you're a warrior you, you lose the fight once but not twice so you want to come back and to knock down or take over your opponent and uh, um, keep or just uh, yes uh, retake what was uh, once yours and this is an important thing Anyway, I hear you here. Yeah, I'm Why would a monk uh, train someone else, for example? And if they train? No, the monk doesn't train. The no. monk, he has text. He read the text. He might he know the text, he read the text. But for example, imagine you take a monk uh, of Buddhism very high class, he knows how to write Chinese because some of them went in China for a couple of months and when they come from China they take, oh this text is very interesting to know Chinese and uh, most of the Chinese over there, I mean the high class uh, um, aristocrat read this and he brings Sun Tzu, Art of War, Sun Tzu, Art of War. So you're a monk, you read Sun Tzu and when you read Sun Tzu to someone who lost war, here in his mind, someone with practical experience is war. When you hear someone read this, makes sense. For the monk, it's just a text. Do you understand what I mean? Now, give me, I'm going to give you a better example. Do you know the TV show called The Sopranos? Hmm? Alright, so here again. Just, just listen carefully. So it's a, a, a mob uh, patron. Uh, known as Tony Soprano, and he has a um, psychological problem, all right? And he goes to see a shrink, all right? And the guy, he, he doesn't know school. His school is killing, make money, make money, and kill. Hmm? Uh, it's a mafia, and plus the Soprano family really exists. So there is one moment in this TV show, very interesting. So the woman the doctor uh, try, you know, to understand his brain, and the guy is raw. Crew direct. He's, he's, stick, he's like this when he talk to her, you know, he has the hand. And, he, and the, the woman is like this. I mean, it's really great. And one moment, so she starts to give him a certain kind of good book for him, you know, to educate him. And she gives him Le Prince, Machiavel, huh? and Sun Tzu, Art of War. Look, the guy is New Jersey. <laughs> voilà. What is going to read on this? And he read the book and he arrived in the front of her and said, you know, you know, that the book is really shit, but there is few things very interesting on that, the way you lead people and things. I think I'm going to use this on my organization. <laughs> Here it is. This is very clever. This is very clever. How someone, mafia mob, you hear me, he doesn't know swirl. He doesn't know spear, he's no Chinese, and he read and he read Sun Tzu in English. Alright? How someone from the mob can understand this? Let me give you another example, very actual, which means the practicality is very important. In America, in most of the jail, of course, there is library, but there is few books who have been completely forbidden. One of them, you know what it is? The Book of the Five Ring, Miyamoto Musashi Gorin no Sho, because some uh, people from different kind of uh, uh, gang read this and there is some uh, explanation on this, like for example, when you have to kill someone, you need to do it strong and vet in order to make an example and to strike a certain point. Well, they read this, they understood directly, they apply it. Here it is, is field experience, practicality, when you read or when you hear someone that doesn't have any clue with practicality but read a scroll, a treatise, you can directly understand what works and what can work. 
And the monk is not responsible. He's the one who listened and what's going to do with it. So this for your first question. What is the second one? You lost it? Hello, I said if they use train anyone. But I have a third one. Good. Okay. The, uh, some of the fake monks used to go to the royal court, right? Mm -hmm. And demonstrate. Or, um, like, anyway, fight with the, the other martial arts. Well, I don't think so. Uh, once once uh, they, they learn, they get out from the temple, they don't stay. Some stay and they become monk forever, and sometimes it is martial arts. The people who demonstrate in the front of the court, like the Ashikaga family, etc., so we have a name, huh? like Tsukara Bokuden did it, Kamizumi Ise did it with one of his students, Kulandolosuke. Um, they, they really demonstrated. So the problem is, what kind of demonstration they did? That's a, a good question. Did they did something we see nowadays on TV? I don't think so. You don't demonstrate uh, eh, 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 in the front of a, a group of warriors, everyone who've been on the battlefield, even the Ashikaga Shogun have been on the battlefield. So most of the time, they took someone from the audience, from the assistants, and they said, please attack me. And they, that's the way they demonstrated. So it's... It's direct, it's practical, and when you demonstrate, and you have the, the word demonstrate is, is, is big huh, for us. It's, I mean, the, the meaning is deep. A demonstration, it's not like just a show. Huh? When, for example, in mathematics or in philosophy, you do a demonstration, you need to have with argumentation, source, chronicle, etc., etc., show that what you do, what you said, is in a certain way a manifestation of the truth. Mm -hmm. So in case of classical martial art, or in case of those masters, when they have to demonstrate this in the front of the uh, shogun, uh, daimyo, first the shogun, the daimyo, and his vassal who's looking, they are not stupid. They are warrior, so they can see directly if what you do is fake or not. So what you're going to have to demonstrate need to touch the heart of the people who's looking. It needs to have something in case of movement, in case of attitude, in the case of uh, uh, the way you uh, handling, disarm, get into the distance of the weapon, the way you hold the weapon, the way you manipulate, that will touch all the audience made of wire. That's how uh, embu, that's what is known as demonstration, uh, in a front of wire was. So it's not, uh, it's not just like, hey, look, kick, uh, showing this world, jumping around, have the smile and the hakama that move. And I don't think it worked like that. Uh, the demonstration was really something that uh, was at the same time, uh, had the spirit, had something that touched people. That was for those fake monks after they... Uh, get out from the temple and start to display their technique and go to the court. Any more questions? Go ahead, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, did they, uh, Ruha, disciples follow a cold of honor like samurai? Oh, yes, yes. First, they were warriors, samurai, bushi, and the word samurai came later. I mean, it's an old name, saburai, but the first time we use it, for example, like uh, samurai is during the end of Edo area. Most of the time we said bushi, warrior. So, yes, they used to be a warrior. Some of those Ryuha were attached to certain domain and warlord, and they become what we call Odome Ryu. Odome Ryu is the Ryuha only for the shogunate and his family or his clothes. For example, the Tokugawa family, they have the Yagyu and the Itoyu and they have a special teaching only for them and it was kept for the family. So few warriors, few um, um, shogun, Oda Nobunaga, uh, Hideyoshi Toyotomi, etc. They had their own uh, Hei Hoka, uh, Shinan Yaku, which means instructor with their own Ryuha and Tof in the uh, uh, warlord vassal uh, 
uh, relationship. And if they um, fail to follow an order, do you have <laughs> practice and proof or? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we know for a fact that when you are attached to uh, a lord, when he die, you die with him. I mean, few example of this, but what you have maybe in the whole uh, classical history of martial art, only one master who did seppuku when his, day, uh, his uh, master died. I think uh, this is the example you should not follow. Uh, but because in classical martial art, what is the most important is the, um, the uh, leg legitimacy of the Ryuha and the family. When you're looking for a place as an instructor, you want to put yourself at the best for the uh, century coming. So you're going to choose most of the time the right uh, Lord that will not die. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there is uh, one behind you. I have two more questions. Yes, please. So uh, the first question is uh, back, in, so let's say, in the 14th century or 15th century. Uh, we, uh, people didn't have like techniques as we understand them today. They had some best practices to deal in a situation. Oh. Um, for example, there is many uh, kanji for uh, waza, huh? and uh, you have the, the kanji we use right now. Uh, it's very interesting. Waza gi. Well, you have two, 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 two kanji. Uh, the one we use nowadays is this one. Huh? And uh, this is a very interesting kanji. Gijutsu, that means, for example, technology. When you want to talk about someone who is an engineer, you're going to say Gijutsu Sha, Gijutsu Ka. And when, for example, you said uh, uh, technique of throwing, huh? Nage Waza, this is the kanji you use. All right? And this is very interesting. You can interpret this kanji in many ways. This kanji is the simplification of this, which means the hand, T. And in Japan, during Edo area, when you said about someone, Udegaru, Tegaru, if you translate it literally, it means you have an arm, you have a hand. It's a little bit stupid. But when you said about that in Edo area, it means this man have a hand, means you have the technique, you have the skills. And this kanji that you translate into it can be the branch of the verb sasaeru, which means to support. So when you cut this, the hand that supports. So here you have a little bit of deep meaning. Technique, it's something that at the same time is a knowledge, but that the hand can create the skills. Now the, the other kanji we use, a little bit more complicated. As you can see, uh, this one is more easy uh, when you learn. This bio kanji, it's everything that deals with detail, with a certain mastery, with a certain uh, subtlety that you're going to have, for example, in kimono, uh, art craft, blacksmiths. So, if you accept the fact that few phrase already in the 7th century, like if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you will never lose uh, 10,000 uh, 10, battle in Japanese is Kare wo shiri, ore wo shiriba, uh, hyakusena yaku arazu, uh, sonshi. Very detailed phrase like that. If already you have strategy plan on how to move a uh, large army, small group in the battlefield with certain uh, tactics. You can be sure that the idea of technique, even if it's uh, not very deep or detailed, already exists. A way to hold the weapon, a way to uh, use the weapon in a faster way, to know where to attack. I think human beings are pretty much aware of the weak point very fast. At the same time, if you already wear an armor and you understand where are the opening you can automatically uh, start to create the measure and the countermeasure to know how to 
overcome those things. There is technique, yes, it exists, but it is something that it's more for the individual, difficult to teach something that you have to copy, something that you have to fit. And the one who can copy like the master, move like him, is the one who can maybe in the future, with his time and the world, able to exist. So I think, yes, technique exists, not very much. You don't have like a set of 10,000 techniques. Yeah. No, no, it's few techniques, and the main meaning is from one principle, 10,000 techniques. That's a very important aspect you have in many of you. It's Ito Manto, from one sever, 10,000 sever. So from one uh, unique principle of using the body, you need to be able to use any kind of weapon, which is logical when you're a warrior on the battlefield. If you're, you don't have a row, you use your bow. If your bow breaks, you use your spear. If your spear breaks, you use what have on the rest until you have no weapon. And the second question in your Jutsu book, you said that uh, there are three types of uh, schools, and the last school is that, that which doesn't use any atemi. Uh, can you explain a little more? Ah, in the section of Jujitsu, I explained there is three different kinds of Jujitsu. Uh, okay, like, it's not really, uh, okay. In the Ninjutsu book, there is a Jujitsu appendix where I explain, yes, or this is the proof I wrote the book myself. So, um, it is a process, like in everything. You start with long weapon, and uh, when I said you start with long weapon, you're very good with a spear of four meters, and you are able, for example, to touch a bird swing without hurting him with a spear at four meters, and the bird is maybe three, four meters. So when you can do that, or uh, take the eyes of a cavalier, uh, a, uh, a cavalier on his horse when he arrives, just one strike. So by doing this, you understand the distance. You have a certain way to feel, no, not to feel, to sense and measure the distance. Once this weapon starts to get shorter, you adapt, you extend the same uh, way of measuring the distance until the moment you have no weapon. So when you know to use a weapon, to move like a weapon, means you understand the angle of a weapon, so you weaponize your body, you weaponize the shape of your body. In other words, the form follows the function. Then you know the function of different range. Then you don't need atemi, you just use the footwork. But this is the highest level. 90% of the, most of the time, women will, was able to do that. Woman, woman, oh. wife, woman, girl. <laughs> that was the highest level for women to be able to do this because they needed to come close. You need to come really close from your enemy. And the only one who could do this is the woman or a child because they are innocent. And at that moment, the warrior doesn't sense any uh, uh, killing danger from a woman from a child. And at the moment when the samurai is okay, everything is cool, and the woman says, oh, you're beautiful, everything is going to be all right, and the man, and slap. <laughs> so in other words, you have to be very careful when a woman comes close to you. I'm joking, of course. You should take this as a very good compliment. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yes, and a question over there? It was a very interesting question put before, just before your presentation by Dr. Samujesko, and that was concerning life and death. So, very simple question, in fact, but with so complex answers. And it is also an old question, so it was in the human mind for ancient times. Uh, so, I will not ask you to answer this question, but uh, coming out from this one, it is a question. So there are so many scientific evidence that life and death coexist, actually. But still we have doubts about it. So the question is for the present one. Um, but what interested me in this evening, it's another question. Um, how much did the old masters and uh, the monks from the temples value human life, actually? 
Uh, sorry, sorry for the, just at the end, I didn't hear. How much did the, the old masters and the monks value human life? Uh, value. Well, uh, you say value the human life, the warrior. But I think first, if we take someone who practice deeply uh, the Buddhism law, human life is very important. So uh, you're going to treasure uh, uh, animal, insect, uh, nature, even in Shinto, uh, trees, uh, the kami is everywhere. So here automatically you have uh, already a philosophy, a way of looking life, uh, a vision of life that really treasure life. So there is a certain kind of value, a high value. That, this is for the monk and the Buddhist. Now for the warrior, uh, you know, I think the treasure, uh, the, the, the only value they have is their value. Yeah, I'm uh, thinking that, okay, um, so many ancient beliefs, uh, they actually believe in life after death. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, just, to re uh, just to come back to what you said about life and death, uh, in classical martial arts, you have this aspect called as kasatsu jizai. Uh, katsu in Japanese uh, means to revive, to uh, reanimate, and satsu means to kill. So there is this idea that if you can kill, you can heal. If you can hurt, you can help. Uh, and uh, during the Edo area, uh, beginning of 16th century, uh, most of the uh, master they uh, used to. Um, Use as a reference things you have in Confucianism in the West that the weapon is evil, weapon is bad. But in the hand of someone who has knowledge, in the hand of someone who is wise, it can be something to control. So they create this aspect of Katsujinken Satsuninto. Satsuninto is the katana that kills people. So the, uh, yes, the killer sab saber. And Katsujinken is the sword that revive people. So sometimes um, a tool, a weapon created for killing can also bring the opposite. If you take, for example, a scalpel, a knife, of course it can kill uh, easy, but with this sometimes you can also heal someone or remove something. So here again, it depends of the one who practice, the value we have is very well versed into spirituality. If he value anything in life, this comes with, of course, the individual, his indication, and the way and the process he's going to do through his life. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, everyone had value. People who stay on the temple, they didn't have to fight, so that was cool. And warrior outside, uh, they wanted that her value was believed, so they used to kill the people who didn't believe to that. That's my opinion too, but back yes. today, they don't believe today. Yes, of course, they, and I think... They say that uh, weapon can be a tool, but they use it also to kill themselves, so they don't want to yeah. get a light in the hands of the enemies. So, there, there was a point. Yes, yeah, there is a... There is a... There is, there is a point, and... And uh, I mean, like uh, my colleague said, um, we need to understand what really characterizes human being. I mean, uh, honestly speaking, from beginning to now, huh, uh, this is not the peace. I mean, we born violent. We we are violent. But let me explain. I'm not saying there is many degree in violent. By violent, I mean we we are in tension. What characterizes the human being? is the tension. For example, you find your uh, phone bill and there is maybe fewer euro more or someone goes in the front of you with the car and suddenly you can set the things the more crazy you want to kill everyone. Doesn't mean you want to do it. But the tension is what um, it's the first manifestation of the human being. But at the same time, with the tension, we have also an aspiration for peace. We're looking for peace. So we are between this Tension and peace, and the job, and the job, if I may say, are all those methodology, uh, religion, spirituality, practical martial arts, it's to find a way to control, to measure, to be ponderate, and that's the hardest work. You mean that the martial art that you call martial art, of course, you know, uh, the, the first pulsion is to kill, 
and uh, you want to keep. I mean, that was the, the first things at the beginning. And then you question yourself why you could not do it. So from that, you're going to again take everything. You're going to even uh, corrupt things that come from Zen, that come from everywhere in order to make your technique faster and higher in order to still kill people. And then according who you are and the experience, you will see that maybe it's not the deal. Maybe there is something more beyond and this depends on each one. It's how you're going to control your tension. And that's the reason why the way of breathing, the way of working things are here. You will be coming to this killing or not killing, being violent or not being violent. I recommend you an amazing, beautiful movie, After the Rain. After the Rain, After yes, the rain. a great movie. And yes, you will see a warrior kept between fighting and not fighting, uh, being violent and being not violent, uh, and healing the violence of the other by his kindness. The, the uh, script of the, uh, the movie script is uh, a Kurosawa, but uh, he couldn't finish the movie. And it's an amazing, gentle and philosophical movie. And I think you could understand very well this uh, dilemma. I think dilemma is a modern mm -hmm. term. They didn't have this dilemma. We have this, yes, uh, yes, we have this we, dilemma. We have this dilemma. Not, uh, not them. But this flew between uh, what he has learned from his master, that he is a warrior, and the philosophical Buddhist term, preserving the life, and uh, learn, doing, teaching the other to, to learn to, uh, to accept the life, to preserve the life. And uh, I was thinking, um, after this beautiful journey through so many, two, three, five centuries of history, and thank you very much, uh, I think there are two very interesting uh, term concept um, flu, the Ryu as a flu, and the other is follow the master and learning by observation. This is very different from our occidental uh, didactical perspective. We always uh, expect that the master teach us and learn and say do that and do so, and here observe the, the master. So thank you very much for these two, two points that were very important for me. There is one thing about this, just I would like to, for all of you. Uh, I mean, most of you here know, uh, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, when you study a little bit the man, uh, you're going to see there is a lot of things. He is known to be the master, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, everything he does. Um, He's, he's born as a bastard, and at that time, in Italia, when you're born as a bastard, you're not allowed to, to be in school. And uh, his grandparents uh, took care of him, and uh, his grandparents could not teach him anything, so he used to go in the nature. And his grandfather told him something when he was young, and he told him so many times that I think that was his best school. He said to him in Italian something like lo piccolo, something like that, which means open the eyes. So observe. So the first thing, the first quality of a strategist, a leader, uh, a teacher, a master, and of course a student, because a leader, master, whatever, is a student, a disciple, it's to observe. And you know what is interesting? When you look the word observe, there is the word serve. So. He might talk a little bit to you. And even now, if we can play like that, I like to play with words. In the word violence, in French, violence, uh, violence, you have the word vie, life. So uh, it's true that when you're violent, means you're full of life. I mean, in a, in a crazy way, of course. But, uh, and this is what we try to control. It's to control those kind of uh, flow, flux of, uh, of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Just a small observation. I think you uh, remind about the children in Afghanistan that they uh, receive a weapon and they are taught to fight. If I, and now I was thinking also in our civilized world, very civilized world, still the boys 
receive from a very very small age tanks and uh, other kind of weapon so okay. still we are we preserve yes we preserve a military education but uh, it's a military education covered in a so-called civilization and uh, we have to discuss about this kind of education military and violent education still preserved in a very perverse yes. way in yes. even in our uh, our world other questions comments i think I I think also it's uh, it's interesting to, to mention that uh, it's okay. I think also it's uh, interesting to mention the fact that uh, in, uh, in Japanese uh, mythology they have the three the three treasures and between the three treasures the thing that uh, they uh, received from that we have the sword. So uh, already maybe it's a different kind of uh, sword that we think in our uh, Western civilization. And uh, according to their uh, mythology, it's a sword that uh, the positive hero will uh, use to purify, to kill the evil. And of course, if that uh, was not uh, understood in the right way, uh, this is uh, another story. And uh, of course, in, in, uh, in temple, like, uh, like Sam said, uh, in many temples, uh, we can find a lot of uh, swords, very uh, huge swords, especially in, uh, in Shinto areas. Because in Buddhist temple they are not allowed with weapons. Weapons they are already think that so uh, like something that will uh, take the life. But in uh, in Shinto they have uh, this uh, sword which is like a, a symbol of transmission from something from from gods. And even in Kashima I think it's a, yes, a yes, big yes. replica. Yes, and like, they, they call it tsurugi. Yes, the tsurugi, the straight uh, yes. sword. And that's mm -hmm. the difference between Kenjutsu and Tojutsu. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, when most of the time in Japan they never use they, they never use the word Kenjutsu like in Kendo. They use the word Tojutsu. To uh, it's katana means the saber and it's a direct reference to the Japanese uh, sword like the Tachi uh, that uh, have been uh, found. I mean, start at the beginning of the 10th century and the, the rise of the warrior. But uh, the word Kenjutsu is used mainly at the end of Edo area and the word Kendo as well in order to legitimate the practice of the weapon. They use the word Ken because it's a direct reference to the Kami, the Shinto and the blade, uh, the straight blade uh, used for correct the people, drive in the right direction, etc. Et yes, please go ahead. I have another question based on what you said. So, why uh, today most uh, uh, ways, uh, so more, uh, the way people uh, practice and they uh, teach this new art, now why don't they keep it like uh, more simple, the techniques more simple, more brutal, in the sense more effective, and they teach a thousand techniques, a thousand great. Uh, <laughs> because they. There is history, there is a context, there is things had by different generations. Uh, and and uh, you need to see things like, um, I look martial art, me like subtraction, supplantation means uh, everything is like a weight. If it's a weight and you have a long journey, you're going to die before you reach the gate. So it is important to remove weight, to remove weight. It's same on the practice, uh, you have tension, works against the tension, remove the tension. But some wants to add and add and add and add. Sometimes the richness is to be simple in certain style. Sometimes we need to be rich because we scare to lose students, so we do this in order to keep students and to keep the money, because keeping students means keep the money. So there is many reasons of that. The more you have technique, the more you have students, the more you can provide. The less you have, the less you have students. So it's always between simplification and complex and complexity. And sometimes the more simple techniques are the more complex. Sometimes you need to create a complexity in order to understand the more simplest. The problem is, is always the, the, the relationship between the master and the student. I said before, you need to observe. Sometimes when you need to teach, when you need to explain, explain. It's to make plain what is outside, you see? Yes. So here, you have someone who doesn't know how to move. 
So you're going to have to create a form from the form in order to help him to move. And what happened? The student say stay on the form because he's comfortable. And from that he creates something more simple. So too much simplification kills the essence. But you need at the same time the simplification. So it's all about the master. Is is it able to simplify and show the complexity at the same time and put the sequence in the flow, or he cannot? Because back in those days, uh, those people were quite effective, good, and very simple. I mean, I mean, you know, effectiveness, effectiveness, and the word effectiveness doesn't mean brutal. No, no, brutal. I, I understand what you mean. Brutal is the pulsion on the battlefield, you're brutal, you're but there is different kind of people. Some are brutal, some are violent, some are raffined, some are skills, some are crazy, and some are straight, some are circular. So all this depends on the way you practice. For example, a technique very simple, there is sometimes the most simple technique, huh? it's not brutal. Effectiveness, the word effectiveness, when you look in any kind of dictionary, it means effect. So it's everything that brings the effect. If it's brutal, the effect is brutal. If it's sweet, the effect is sweet. Flow, soft, etc. So what we're looking for in classical martial arts is the ultimate effect, which means impossible to see, impossible to read, and at the same time, good in the long term. Because if you're effective, but you lose, you lose one arm, one leg, okay, you're open and die, but you're uh, like a cripple. Well, you're effective, but uh, the definition and the nature of the effectiveness needs to be uh, here. In Shinkageyu, in Katori, they have many techniques, but sometimes in order to know one technique, you need to study all the techniques. That's the reason why there is many techniques, because there is many opponents, many ways, many situations, but only one way to answer. Yes. Thank you very much. Pleasure. One more. That's cool. Uh, this reminded me about Bruce Lee, who actually said that... Big fan. Yeah, he, he, he always said something about a water, be like water, he had this, um, yes. this idea. Yes, yes. I mean, it was not his idea, he took it from... Yeah, he took it, of course. So, he said uh, that he's not interested in a technique, he's interested in uh, coping with any technique he would uh, get uh, to find. So, so his style, uh, Angela Kundo, Jekundo, was more interested in coping with every kind of situation as possible. So. Alors, you have to understand the context. I mean, as a big fan of Bruce Lee, a very, very big fan, and you know, sometimes you become big fan, big fan, fan to fanatic, and fan come from fanatic, and then one day you eat too much, and uh, here it is. Alors Bruce Lee, of course, great, uh, but uh, first what he practiced is Tai Chi Chuan with his father, all right? Uh, and then he learned a little bit of Wing Chun. Some people said he didn't have the level. Then when he came in America, uh, he had to face very strong people. And that's a very important aspect. When they talk about Yip Man, Yip Man was a great master, or that Japanese master was a great master, or very good, yes, it was Chinese against Chinese, Japanese against Japanese. Once you put an African on there, and an American, someone who have different size, different muscle, technique change completely. It doesn't work. That's why you have a lot of teachers who doesn't want to teach to foreigners because they learn faster, especially something which is based on physical aptitude. You teach, for example, wrestling to someone who is uh, very strong and carry a tree and things like that. Wrestling is easy. All right? You teach to boxing someone when he, when he just tried. It's all about the question. So Bruce Lee had a great idea. When he arrived in America, this is where he started to read many, many books. And he was very fond of Taoism, Confucianism, and mysticism as well, yin and yang, etc., etc. And this aspect of be like the water, be water, my friend, I be water, be water, that's the phrase he used with his accent. It's something you find in many classical ryuha in China, like in Japan, to be fluid. Fluid and be able to act. Um, adapt yourself and copy anything. That's a very important aspect. Even in Miyamoto Musashi's book, you find this aspect. The problem is, in an idea, is great. It's to be able to do it. Uh, Bruce Lee was not really good in weapon. Uh, of course, when you look at Nunchaku, is great the way he used the bow. Yeah, but that was not the things with us world. You never used Nunchaku against a katana. It's only on movies. Uh, in order to be able to create that, now you need to understand that. It's the idea I understand is great. And what he, 
present on the Jet Kundu is great. Problem is, be able to do it based on what? On boxing, mixing boxing with a little bit of judo and wrestling. It doesn't work like that. The idea in classical martial arts is yes, but um, the idea he had was what is, is at the beginning of MMA, for example, mixed martial art. It's pretty much like this. But taking, for example, Wing Chun to mix with ju Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. It's a different mind. It's a different mindset. It's for different technique. For example, you practice technique where you are allowed to go in the eyes and take the groin. In Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's no thing where everything is on the ground. You need to put together what can be put together and not put together what, which mm, things which are historically and by purpose completely different. An art of killing cannot be an art of sport. It's very different. The rules are different. The way of using the body is different. Economy of energy, economy of movement, economy of space. This is what classical martial art learn. And this is, of course, this aspect of be the water is. So that's why when people use Bruce Lee, yes, but uh, we need to see the range of uh, uh, the idea here. Yeah. So how would you, um, how would you uh, act in order to, 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 let's say, fight against someone who you don't know anything about? Like, you don't know his technique, you don't know anything about him, but you should be prepared to face him. Yes, so it's this is my, my, my question. How would you be prepared? Yes, you have to be patient. You have to wait. The first for, thing you learn, yes. For his first move? Of course. You have to wait and then, and then your capacity to adapt. That's why you need to study and learn a lot. If you want to be prepared, well first you never prepare. You have to understand that. Uh, you never prepare for the real fight, you never prepare for the problem, you, re you never prepare. Which means uh, uh, you are prepared for sports, all right? There is a competition, you do the things. But for real, something real, you never prepare. You never, never prepare because there is always an unknown, an unexpected thing. So it's how practice and teach to your body in order to expect the unexpected. You have to practice and study every day every day and when it happens your capacity to adapt is what is the key you don't know the, the man you're gonna fight or the woman you're gonna fight all right you don't know you don't know his style you don't know what he does and if you didn't study anything and uh, you didn't learn anything and you don't practice anything your capacity of the adaptation are already 50 percent 40 percent out so what remains is your survival way of doing the things because we are all uh, we are all have this survival way. So you might survive with one eye less or one finger less. It's a good way to survive too. Or you're going to survive by taking the initiative and go direct. It depends of many, many things. But first, who you are. After all, is all this, no matter what you learn and practice, is who you are deep down inside you. What you know can be the positive value added or the, the worst. If someone attack like this, you don't know. If you, you fail, uh, you, for example, you have a problem on your right hand, okay? You, you, your right hand, tac, tac, tac. You practice always from the right side, and you have a problem on the right hand. I don't know, an injury. You're gonna say to the man or the woman, stop, you know, my right hand is, can you come the next day? Uh -huh. It doesn't work like that. So you're gonna have to face. So your instinct inside is gonna use everything you gave him study, knowledge, experience, and something's going to come out. Let's hope this thing's going to be cool, nice and sexy to watch and effective. When we are saying to uh, wait for the opponent, but most statistically, most of the fights, for example, in the street, the guy who hits first the most, most of the time is the winner. <laughs> well, I'm not thinking about the winners. Huh? Sometimes you can... Yes, the, the one who strikes the first, etc. Yes, but it depends on many things. The capacity to receive. Huh? Some people give the first blow, and what happened? It's the opposite. The guy wake up, is crazy, he ran after you. And the uh, element of surprise is good, but uh, the surprise goes in both ways. So uh, you, you can't fix things. Only if you're a killer, you have to go with a knife and the clack, you attack some place, and everything is done. It depends on what kind of level we're talking about here. Street fight, simple street fight. I mean, 
simple street fight, I don't understand what's simple street fight. Because for example, when you said street wise or street knowledge, for me, uh, it tells a lot. It tells already about drugs, about killing, about... First, if you are on that situation and you don't know that you are on the situation, well, uh, don't practice martial arts. If there is nothing in your mind that already prepare you, why do you take this road? Why uh, did you see that guy? Why did you smell it? Nah. <laughs> no reason to practice martial arts. You're talking about situation and awareness, but I'm, what I'm thinking about concretely is about, uh, I mean, two guys just shout at each other and they start... Uh, but that's their job, I don't came inside, we don't know. What? I mean, if two guys go to each other, I'm just a spectator, I don't stay. You, you know, you need to understand. Two, one, fight each other. I mean, no business with me, all right? If one is a, a, a child and the other one, well, maybe I might help, or maybe it's a scam, they pretend this, like this someone come and they kill him and take his money. So you know what, the best is always to stay at home and to choose the place where you go and to be very, very careful. That's why the first thing is to be patient and to wait and to observe. And you need to cultivate the way of observing that you observe in the blink of an eye, and I'm going to finish on this, every classical martial art, any kind of treaties fighting all around the world, military science is based on one thing, art of observation. You don't know how to observe, to be able to, for example, when you get in the room, whatever the room, cinema, theaters, restaurant, even in your home, to be aware of the first exit, where are the windows, how many people there is, the weight of each one, if they have a weapon, close the eyes and remember the situation of everyone, how many steps you did from the door you get in, you're not aware of that. But hey, don't get me wrong, huh? you drink Coca-Cola, you stay relaxed, watch, observation is always the best. Thank you. A pleasure. What? Sorry, in the European, in the Occidental mentality, we learn or we are uh, taught that attack is a better defense. Yeah. So that's one with one of the first strategy lessons. Mm -hmm. So attack, surprise the enemy, and not not wait. Waiting, it's not very good. So it's very interesting to discuss about actually, patience actually, and, uh, we need to talk about that, but. Uh, we know this, the best defense is the attack. Huh? We know this all around the world. Huh? Well, let me tell you, it's the opposite. The best defense is the attack is based on the element of surprise. All right? But when, for example, you have to face, let's say you take two tigers, two tigers, two soldiers, two tigers, they have the same weapon, same skills. Maybe one is older or young. When they fight, they are pretty much the same. Who's going to win? The one who's the most clever, the one who have, let's say, the luck on his side. So now let me tell you what it is about the, the best defense uh, is the attack. In classical martial arts, you think different. Is kentai hyori. So you learn to defend in against every attack. So you learn the defense against any attack. So the experience of the defense against any attack allow you to record, practice, experiment any kind of attack. In a certain way, when you attack, your attack is a defense at the same time. So the best attack is the one that includes the defense inside. That's what we call this in classical martial art, Kobo Jizai, Kobo Ichijo, the attack and the defense in one. And you have this in Chinese martial art, now it's how you're going to apply that. Don't forget, in the word defense, there is the word fence. So, you have to take care of the fence sometimes too. Okay, we have another one question. Last yes, question one last question, here. please. Yes, one last question right. here. This is a very interesting conference, and um, yeah, after the discussion, the questions, a quote came into my mind. It said, um, "Only warrior can choose to be passive, uh, a pacifist." The others, um, they are condemned to it. So uh, I did an effort to trans transfer myself imaginary in that world, a violent world, a medieval world. And um, 
I understand it. So uh, I have a question. You said uh, that were uh, I, I know that um, there are two kinds of temples. There were two cults. One cult, the Shintoist, and one religion, Buddhist. And uh, the Shintoist is the major, major uh, cult. No, which uh, temple? Which kind of cult? Uh, led uh, more um, a, a heritage, a more he more heritage of uh, martial arts to the world. Uh, well, of course, uh, it, it depends on the period. For example, uh, when Buddhism Zen start to be very developed, uh, the Zen, especially the Rinzai, because you have Soto Zen and Rinzai, the Rinzai, it depends on the monk and it depends also of the one who practice. If, for example, he was educated in a Buddhist Zen family, so automatically he's going to believe in the Buddhist Zen, only if he changed during his process. If, for example, he's from Mikyo, so everything that is with uh, Kujikiri, etc., etc., it depends also of the area where the family lives or the influence of the master. Now, uh, in case in Japan, it's a country of syncretism. So where you everything. So they have that kind of thing, the Japanese, to be in balance between the two. It's a little bit difficult for us because uh, we choose. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, I have met one master who died a few few months ago, and he's a Japanese Christian. And he have his church and he's a soke of uh, Itoryu, one of the famous school. His name is Sazamori. And they are a Christian since three generations in his family, uh, Protestant. So what is very interesting, in his church he have his dojo. And uh, when you open certain door, you have weapon. Imagine weapon in a church. And uh, I talked to him. I mean, Itoryu is known to be influenced by Takwan ID. You have these things, you have the Hokuto Shichisei, you have the Buddhist. He said, yeah, I don't touch that. I'm, I'm Christian. Uh, I have a sensei, uh, you don't believe? Uh, I believe, I mean, I respect, but uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Jesus, one God. All right? And the other question is when we had a, a combination between the sword and the faith, yes, the Templars yes. Yes. and a similar... Yes, so it's how, how balanced you are enough to find your way and which is the uh, doctrine, the spirituality that will touch your heart and then how it's going to influence you and how you're going to influence your practice. Nowadays some people are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, uh, atheist, agnostic, it depends on who you are. Me, I think if, if it's a light, it will enlighten. If it's a plus, it will be plus. If it's a big, it's going to be worse. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Thank you very much for the conference. Thank you very much Pleasure. for your audience. And uh, we are waiting for you on the... The other? Yeah, so, uh, I need to uh, prepare. I, I invite in, uh, in your name, I invite uh, Dr. Kassem. Thank you, Kassem is enough. To join us for another conference. Uh, we hope very soon. Not very soon. No, no, we hope very soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And don't go, please, uh, final photo as always. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.